In this, the first of three episodes, we explore how the circular economy holds critical answers to tackling climate change, biodiversity loss, and the urgent need to protect and regenerate our land and oceans. And let's start with climate change. When we entered into the, the, the climate space and we looked in great detail at how the circular economy can help us to tackle climate change, it really struck me that so much of the climate conversation is about switching to renewables and energy efficiency, which is obviously absolutely vital. That we, you know, we understand that, everybody understands that. But then there's the kind of the 45%, which is about how we make products, how we use products. That could be you know, cars or phones or food systems. They have a massive implication towards climate change. And yet, in the conversation, that, that part doesn't seem to be illustrated as well, particularly at COP26. Do you think it's there enough? No, it's definitely not there enough. And I am, you know, thoroughly delighted that you all um, are pushing on this because to be perfectly honest, um, we are still at the point in which most of the effort and most of the focus and most of the financing is going toward how do we produce X. How do we produce energy? How do we produce transport? Um, how do we produce food? And so we're still very much caught into this linear thinking and still uh, caught in chapters one and two of that linear thinking, right, which is extraction and use. And we haven't closed the loop to figure out, and then what happens? Once you produce the solar panel, once you produce the, uh, the wind turbine, once you produce the electric vehicle, and then what? And it's that and then what that we're not focusing on yet, right? We're going at this and addressing climate and emissions very much from a linear economy perspective without fast forwarding or thinking to the end of that linear and then asking, you know, the very difficult question, then what happens? And then we're surprised, right? We're surprised when somebody comes up with saying, well, then, you know, when you produce all of these EVs, then the batteries that, you know, we're going to have to discard, here is the environmental, you know, damage from those batteries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, why didn't we think about that at the very beginning and design that differently? Can you explain why or suggest why having those many crops in an integrated mixed farming system can be much more beneficial than, you know, trying to take a monocrop and make it more regenerative? Why, why as we diversify, does that lead to better benefits? So biodiversity can be brought back, but we need to understand what kind of species can be incorporated into the design so that we can have that kind of uh, abundance uh, and not having to need any kind of like external uh, inputs such as pesticides to, to, to control this pest and disease that comes in plants. And this is, you know, a really, uh, this is really something that is happening with uh, not only, you know, looking at um, uh, individual projects, but for instance, working with coffee farmers in Brazil, uh, they are being, you know, highly impacted by climate change and climate change is putting them under pressure in terms of the amount of pests and disease coming to coffee plants. Uh, look, for instance, nematoids and, and also uh, the bichominado, which is, uh, I'm not familiar with the English word for that, but this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of pest and disease, they are, you know, really making the farm, farmer's life more difficult and not even the pesticides is actually being able to control them. So we are creating an environment where we plant species along with the coffee that allows this resilience uh, and the uh, biodiversity increase to mitigate such challenges. What we heard from Felipe from Renature earlier is some of the great benefits when it comes to healthy soils, above and below ground biodiversity, and all sorts of benefits for nature and regenerating nature. But what about for the farmers and the farmer communities, their livelihoods? I know you have lots of programs working directly with them. What kind of benefits can regenerative production bring the farmers themselves? So look, we're in complete agreement about how the end game looks like and uh, where we want to go. But the transition is not going to be easy. And this whole notion of a just transition for these fragile uh, farming communities we're dealing with is going to be a major piece. 
So there's fresh investment needed. Uh, there is additional training needed, know-how. And frankly, for some crops, you will also see probably an initial dip when it comes to yields before things turn better. And so um, the farming community in, for many crops is uh, the weakest link when it comes to the uh, supply chain, financially speaking, they're the most exposed. Uh, I think Nestle has 150 years of experience in dealing with fragile agricultural communities around the world and uh, being a long-term reliable partner. And so we know that we have to help these communities to go through that change so that together we can get where we want to go. So Mark, we spoke a bit about the benefits for nature when it comes to applying regenerative production practices. But then there's also the core premise of food, which is delivering nutrition to people, everyone around the world. And often these two worlds are seen as separate, planetary health and human health. And sometimes people perceive there's actually tension or trade-offs between them. How do you see that dynamic? Are there trade-offs? Um, I don't think there are trade-offs. I think these two are mutually uh, reinforcing each other. So we believe in two key strategic blanks at our company, and I could summarize at high level with good for you, good for the planet. So good for you is nutritious food that is uh, conducive uh, to your health, and good for the planet is uh, good sustainability practices and regenerative practices that make sure we're not strip mining uh, the planet. Um, the two are really reinforcing each other. Just think about plant-based uh, proteins. Uh, in our Western diets, uh, we're so over-indexed on uh, animal proteins. Uh, so bringing that down has vast uh, public health benefits. And at the same time, it reduces uh, the environmental footprint of, um, of uh, producing uh, those proteins. So I wanted to hear from you and... Companies like Unilever and other food manufacturers and retailers, what can they do to help actually build rather than deplete biodiversity through their very products and supply chains? Yeah, yeah. I, I think a really important start point is that biodiversity will be driven in the end by more diverse consumption. Um, Today, uh, you all know it, but just four crops, wheat, rice, corn, potatoes, account for about 60% of the calories we all consume globally. So if we as big foods players don't change what people eat, we're not going to create a shift to the more diverse demand that the planet needs. So that's what we've also at Unilever been focusing on education. So um, last year, together with the WWF, we released the Knorr Future 50 Foods Report. Um, and that is a really interesting report that identifies 50 diverse foods that we should eat more of um, in order to increase biodiversity. Um, if we want more diversity, more crop diversification, um, you know, we need to eat more new foods. So at a very practical level, Knorr now offers swaps in its products and recipes. So things like using lentils in instead of beef in a bolognese or quinoa for rice in a curry or sweet potatoes instead of potatoes. You've been looking a lot of the about uh, the the nexus between biodiversity and climate and the interconnect, interconnected nature of, of 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 land use. What are your most recent thoughts in that space? We're beginning to see much more attention to the capacity that the Earth has to capture carbon out of the air and um, sequester it and sink it into biomass and back into the soils where it belongs. The interesting thing, from your perspective, of course, is that that is the natural cycle of CO2. We have actually dug up cycle, they um, dug up CO2 from dinosaurs that have been keeping the CO2 down there for millions of years. We've dug it up. We have produced liquid fuels and solid fuels, coal, um, oil, gas. Uh, from that, we have released that into the air. And it's that linear release of CO2 that has gotten us into the problem to begin with. If we now bend that and say, okay, that's been released in the air. In the meantime, we have used it for our purposes. But how do we now bend that third chapter, right? It's basically being released as waste, as pollution into the air. Hence, producing climate change. If we actually mentally now understand, okay, that's up in the air. Now, how do we bring that back? Yes, we have to 
cut down on how much of greenhouse gases we're emitting, absolutely. But in addition to that, all of that CO2 or most of that CO2 that is out there can be bent back down into much more of a circular concept where you relocate CO2 into the soils, into the biomass, um, and therefore make natural systems much more healthy and much more capable of producing food, wood, trees, everything uh, that, uh, that then produces photosynthesis and then the circular uh, cycle, the cycle of CO2 continues. We have broken the cycle of CO2. That's the problem. 